always know for some of the species in this uh, short park tour, uh, I will be a underpaid tour guide and I will be talking out of my backside for some of the dinosaurs in this. I understand there is a lot more than three species of Allosaurus. Um, think of it as a role play experience. Think of um, all the dinosaur sheets as somewhat outdated and some of them are like brand spanking new because, you know, underpaid, understaffed, you know, all that Jurassic World stuff. Most of the money is the dinosaurs, not the staff. <laughs> This is not the most historically accurate dinosaur video out there, I will repeat that. This is not the most scientifically accurate dinosaur video out there. If that bothers you, uh, maybe find something that is scientifically accurate, you know. Hello and welcome to Jurassic World Canada. Um, I am standing in front of the Around the World um, there is also a mural that goes around the park, but that is the outside of the park because this is actually built on a piece of a very large um, national park. So, the mural goes around the outside of the national park because you may see some uh, wild animals as well as dinosaurs today. Um, they are, dinosaurs are in biozones because um, we do get frequent snowstorms up here in this national park. Excuse me, man. <laughs> we do get a lot of snowstorms up in this national park, so they have been put into temperature controlled and regulated uh, biodomes that will mimic their temperatures and the biomes. The biomes, however, are not the prehistoric biomes, they are actually the, uh, what they would sort of be like in the present day. Please bear in mind you will see dinosaurs in some of the biomes that shouldn't be in that area, for example, like that have in Europe. Um, just pretend they've been discovered there, okay? Because some dinosaurs look lonely in the biomes, so just pretend they've been discovered there today. Okay. Please keep your arms and legs inside this vehicle at all times, or at least try to. Some of our dinosaurs have been known to be rather nippy. They will not eat us, but they are just curious. Especially the Tyrosaurs. <laughs> Please keep your seatbelts uh, fastened while the truck is moving, as we may encounter difficult terrain along our route. Let me what he said. <laughs> we do have um, pre-recorded um, little pieces of information as well. I will try to pause so you can hear the pre-recorded information, but I will also try to give slightly more information uh, on some of these dinosaurs today. So in here is one of the large North American biomes. We are still moving. No, we don't want to move. We want to stop. Thank you. Anyway, this is our North American biome. Um, I'm gonna move out the way of this tour bit, but I'm gonna move around. Each to dinosaur group you see in the park has a socially accepted leader. For some species, this leader is recognized as the group's alpha, but it may find itself being challenged regularly to retain its status. Okay. Uh, we have just to say with three important messages, so we will get a But in here we have some Parasaurolophus, there's one uh, sleeping right there. We have some Triceratops, and we have some Dracorex. Um, you probably know about Parasaurolophus, it's quite a popular one, you've probably read about them in your kids' books. Um, but it also has a Asian cousin known as Saurolophus, and we are reversing, we don't want to be reversing. <laughs> but yeah, um, it has a Asian cousin known as Saurolophus. So we have Parasaurolophus, which is the nearly crested lizard, and we have Saurolophus, which is the fully Thank you very much, the fully crested lizard. <laughs> That's some information for you today. Um, at Parasaurolophus, do um, eat some water plants that are growing slightly under the artificial lake that we have in the uh, dome today. We also have our Triceratops, there's one um, lying down for you, striking a pose. Um, our Triceratops are very brazen, actually, probably a little bit closer to her, so she shouldn't really challenge us or see us as a threat. Uh, she's having a nice dust bath there. 
So Triceratops, as you may already know, know is uh, means fruit horned face, obviously. Uh, the full version of her scientific name is Triceratops horridus, which means horrifying or horrible free horned face. And how could you say that? Come on. Parasaur olive bush, you all. Thank you. How could you say that? She's beautiful. She's gracious. Uh, she also has osteoderms on her back. Thank you very much. Oh dear. It's going to get bumpy. Hold on your butts. But yeah, she also has osteoderms on her back to somewhat protect her. Oh god, getting a little close. To somewhat protect her from big predators such as Tyrannosaurus. And as for the Draco Bricks, I don't know if you're going to be able to get close to her. Let me see. Wrong camera. <laughs> it's getting a bit chaotic in here. But the Draco Rex is one of the. The Draco Rex um, is a small pachycephalosaurid. It has been theorised to be, not be its own species, but be a baby version of the Pachycephalosaurus and or Stygimoloch. They're all said to theoretically be from the same genus, adult baby juvenile sort of thing. Um, but I don't believe that. I believe it's a separate species. It, it, it looks wildly different than Pachycephalosaurus and Stygimoloch. <laughs> but yeah, its name actually comes from um, Dragon King which is a homage to some of the larger and more wacky and out there horns that it has compared to its other relatives. Uh, its full name is Dracorex Hogwartsia, which means the Dragon King of Hogwarts, which some of you may know as being the uh, fictional school from Harry Potter we are going to move on. Please refrain from feeding our dinosaurs as adorable as they are. They do have a very regulated diet and specified feeding times. So in here, as I said earlier, we have our... Can we get any little closer? Just a, just a little closer. Not too close. There we go. We have our Tyrannosaurus pair. This is a male and a slightly smaller female, as you can see. Um, our biodomes are soundproof from the inside, so you can hear the tour very um, clearly. So if it seems like our Tyrannosaurus are... Hello. Our Tyrannosaurus are mute. That is why it is very soundproof in here. They are very loud. We have tried to um, minimize their roars because it is theorized that they roared so loudly it would be about the same amount of decibels as a steam train. So that is very loud. <laughs> we also have in here, if you can see them, our pteranodons. Pteranodon actually means um, winged teeth, even though pteranodon aren't technically supposed to have teeth. But we have genetically engineered them here at um, Jurassic World in Canada to have teeth just to make them a bit more fascinating. Take a look for yourself. Yes. Okay, that's it for this uh, dome. And we will take a. Oh dear. We will take a small ride to our third and final North American dome. As you can see, these uh, Jurassic Park information boards, they give us um, the species that are in here, uh, just in case you want to know the big dome. This is our Rocky Mountains sort of themed habitat, and as you can see, right in front of us, having a nap, um, it is around just after lunchtime that we are doing this tour, so you may see some animals taking a short uh, post-lunch nap. But we have Stegosaurus with its bony um, roofs, because, you know, roof is it? There's another one taking a nap. Uh, we also have Ankylosaurus. Uh, we have the unmissable Camarasaurus. And I'm pretty sure we also have a small carnivore in here. Yes, we do. It's over there. It's Dilophosaurus. Um, if you're wondering, do these attack? Uh, the large armoured herbivores in here? The answer is no. Two reasons. One, they know much better than to attack something with that much armour. Um, the Stegosaurus can launch its phagomized tail at about 35 miles per hour. That is very fast. That will be, that will crush you. <laughs> so let's try and not be hit by one today. The Ankylosaurus swings its tail a little uh, less speed, but it is blunt and blunt does more damage 
and crushing their bones more. So let's try not to be hit by those today. Um, they can be a little defensive, but they have just eaten, so they might not attack us today. Our Dilophosaurus also, um, we have put a lot of um, aquatic reptile DNA in them, such as marine iguanas and smaller species of crocodiles, such as uh, spectacle caimans. So, as you can see, I'll try and drive them closer to it so you can see a bit more. As you can see, um, that halt has also affected the diet, so they prefer to eat fish now. Right, okay. Oh dear. Let's move out of the way. Sorry, bud. <laughs> Our Stegosaurus, we have a theory as to Stegosaurus, but we will tell you that later. Um, and Kylosaurus just chilling and going to the water. See, they're quite like docile, but they, they can have their moments where they think the car is a little too close and they might smack us around just a little bit. Okay. Um, now, sauropods, interestingly enough, um, there's an interesting scientific discovery that sauropods actually have their nose right at the tippy top of their heads. Like, right at the tippy top of their heads. Uh, this is so that they can breathe much more easier in the um, taller air and stuff, because they, they, some of them are so big. Like, how do they breathe, right? So they have like this really big and complex respiratory system, uh, and they also, can we please, <laughs> and they also um, have their nose at the tippy top so that they can you know, get the air from right at the top of the nice fresh crisp air. So that's a little information about sauropods. And uh, we're recently going out of North America. Oh dear, there's a visit. Uh, rest assured, our cheeks are heated. I don't know how temperature regulated that is with the whole cage, but they are heated. Rest assured, we are going into South America to some of the more out there carnivorous species, calm tourists. They are just having a nice sit and striking the pose for us. Um, despite their mean, as you can see, despite their uh, mean looks and um, sort of grisly appearance. Uh, Contrast is actually relatively passive. It is going to ignore us though, so we will move on and move really close. Its name means flesh eating ball as reference to its two interestingly pointed horns of the uh, tip of its skull. We also have Tapiara, an interesting uh, species of pterosaur. We're not exactly sure what that brightly coloured crest is for. Oh, one's coming down to take a drink right next to us. Very lovely. But we can theorise that the brightly coloured crest was for um, telling who's who. Like, they would have different patterns, no two crests would be exactly the same. Um, males may have had larger crests than females, uh, so it's a bit of sexual dimorphism, and also bright colours to attract. Sorts, with its lovely spiky frill of um, on its neck. Um, we're not entirely sure what these were for. Maybe they sort of like whipped their neck around a bit as like a threat to large carnivores, much like giraffes do today. Um, but we're not entirely sure what those were for. Maybe they, it's a like mating display or something. We're not entirely sure what those were for. But a rather small species of um, we also have a Ranosaurus. It's not supposed to be in here, but it's filling in for another interesting sauropod species of dinosaur. Let me just check my notes and I'll tell you exactly what one that is. It is filling in for Uniosaurus. And it doesn't like it apparently. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am. We also have. Um, well, the sail, first off, is thought to be temperature regulated because South America is quite hot, you know. South America still is rather hot and tropical. And muggy. Excuse me. Excuse me, please. Thank you. 
we also have two Tropianathus. They do eat fish, despite their grizzly appearance. Oh, it's kind of close to us. Let's see. One has landed, that's it. Despite their sort of grizzly appearance, they are fish eaters, but their grizzly appearance does happen to spook some of our smaller dinosaurs in here, such as the Dryosaurus. So, just bear that in mind. Dryosaurus means uh, tree lizard, as a reference to, I'm assuming, its legs and its habitat, because it was found in a lot of Some sort of friends, you know. She might be sort of like showing us stuff that makes sense. But we have, um, is it a little bit closer to it? Well, not too close. Let's see if she swipes this one. I'll tell you, a little close. That might be what she is. There we go, that should be close enough. Spice! Excuse me, ma'am! <laughs> Spinosaurus, uh, which obviously a spiny lizard. Uh, this is not exactly how Spinosaurus should have looked. Um, this is our DNA is based on a uh, more primitive model from less fossils that we have uh, found. So unfortunately, we have not updated the DNA. But I mean, she is still beautiful, right? <laughs> um, the more updated version, her teeth would be slightly more crooked and suited to eating fish. Her spine would be larger and much more shaped like an M, hello other vehicle. And her tail would be very interestingly enough, um, kind of big, finned, paddled, kind of like a tadpole's tail, but on a much larger scale. You know, all that sort of good stuff. Um, she was um, semi aquatic, actually. Uh, there has been a lot of controversy on that. There's been a lot of controversy on whether the spine source it is semi iconic but it has been uh, recently confirmed. Uh, there was another interesting theory that the spine source may have been a prehistoric sea but uh, we'll just ignore that a bit. Uh, let's just say he was on a rather trippy herbivorous diet. <laughs> uh, we also have Mara, of course. Uh, they have more teeth than we do, only in their front jaw. Well, they have like teeth on their front and like upper and lower jaws, but we usually have, say, about what 30 teeth on average in our adult skulls, like upper and lower. They have 35 on the top alone. Just quick work on that. Interesting. Make our promise here in Jurassic World before we get louder and more teeth. On to the African Savannah enclosure. We're gonna undertake a friends here. And as you can oh dear, there's a friend over. As you can already see, we have two the heads are that big, they're off the screen. <laughs> we have two very large, but very in charge dreadnoughts filling in for Giraffe Titan in this enclosure. We also have a very small, very uh, spooked, <laughs> very skittish uh, Kentrosaurus, of which they all seem to be having a nice splash in the water in the today. Must be uh, rather hot in this biodome. We usually put this particular biodome for about 35 degrees. 
because Africa is rather hot. We also have a wandering pack of very bright amalocephalite. Um, unlike their bigger cousins, they wouldn't really use their um, heads for headbutting much as um, it was rather close to their skull and rather softer. So instead, they would often um, get into chitter battles, where if they want to assert their dominance, it would be whoever sings at the uh, best frequency, uh, the females will judge, and who can hold note for the longest. Kind of fascinating uh, information there. We also have, but they seem to be in the water, can we get in the water with them? Yes, we can. They're also having a bit of a swim today. We have some Spicamellus in here. Um, interesting thing about the Spicamellus is we don't actually really know too much about what the Spicamellus look like. Um, its name means collar spikes, in reference to the fact that it is a it's rather spiky. And also to the fact that we have only seemed to have found a top layer of spikes that are actually attached to the, um, to the back. Now, the interest, there's an interesting theory when it comes to why Ankylosaurus lived longer than Stegosaurus, because this Spicamellus changed all of our research. This Spicamellus was around at the same time as some more African uh, Stegosaurus were starting to die out, such as Kentrosaurus. <laughs> and the theory is that the reason that the Stegosaurids died off before the Ankylosaurus did is because they were largely outcompeted by their bigger, more heavily armoured cousins when they like started to evolve into more bulkier forms such as Polycanthus, Hylocephalus, and Ankylosaurus. Uh, another theory is as to why these dinosaurs have the roofy uh, plates is that the theory was that cartilage and muscle, obviously muscle doesn't uh, fossilise and cartilage is very hard to fossilize because it deteriorates a lot faster than bone. A theory is these plates would flap down onto the sides of the body and form rel relatively primitive armor. So basically proto-ankylosaurids before ankylosaurus uh, became a thing. And because uh, ankylosaurus were more heavily armored than stegosaurids, unfortunately they became easy food when the ankylosaurus came and, you know, the rest of history. history. On to a different biome now. We are going into Europe. Now, an interesting thing about Allosaurus, because you might be thinking the odd one out here is the Allosaurus and not the Dimorphodon. The Dimorphodon is filling in for a small pterosaurid uh, that we found in Europe known as Cryodraken, which translates to Icy Dragon. It was recently found off of the Isle of Wight, we think. Can't remember exactly, but I'm sure I'll be corrected on the walkie-talkie. Uh, we also found recently some more Spinosaurids in Europe because uh, originally it was just sort of baryonyx, but we have also found some new spinosaurids, uh, such as... Let me check my uh, research here. Reprovenator, I think is what it's called. Uh, but Allosaurus, <laughs> while we're in here. Um, there was actually three species of Allosaurus. There was Allosaurus fragilis, which is the American Allosaurus, or fragile, different lizard. Uh, we have Allosaurus maximus, also known as Saurophaganat, which was the Asian Allosaurus. And we have Allosaurus grandis, which is the European Allosaurus. So think places like Spain. They are um, pack hunting, well, not necessarily pack hunting, but group hunting um, species. They would usually uh, be solitary but form small groups of up to three individuals to hunt larger prey, such as sauropods. 
Another interesting thing while we uh, take a short stroll through the forest, you may find some wild sheep. There's a big uh, sheep population. But another thing while we slowly cruise up through this dome is Allosaurus is very interesting, and this might be another reason why it's quite different than this other than the fact it had crests. You can see a sneak peek into the rip here. Um, is because it used to use its jaws very fascinatingly. It used to um, use its head kind of like a hatchet, so instead of like just biting into it, they would like yank their heads down onto prey like a hatchet. So that would have been very uh, gruesome to see. But this is the herbivorous uh, Europe area. This is based on uh, the pine forests that you see up in the more northern parts, such as Scotland and Wales. We have Iguanodon, a slightly coastal Iguanodon skin. Um, a fascinating fact about Iguanodon, it has a thumb spike to sh shred off bits of leaves off the plants that it eats. Uh, its hands were very um, opposable, for lack of a better word. Its thumbs weren't, but its its digits were very like flexible, so it could kind of grab things. Prehensile, that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you, walkie talkie men. Uh, another interesting thing about Iguanodon is, uh, when it was first discovered, they thought that the thumb spike would be on its nose. And you can see an incorrect version of Iguanodon in one of the very popular parts in London. Keep an eye on that, even if you visit. We also have Stigmolloc, which is in replacement of a small Pachycephalus storage, known as Pachycephalus, or the Mushroom Headed. And I'm pretty sure we have another dinosaur in here somewhere. Let's find them. They can be really good shape. There they are. This is Polycanthus, which is one of the very few Ankylosaurids that um, actually lived, n n never mind in like um, Europe, but in Great Britain. Anchi um, this Polycanthus used to live in Great Britain. The Guanodon used to live on the Isle of Wight uh, because prehistoric. Britain used to be very swampy, like you were very lucky if you would actually find land that wasn't just like flooded or covered in marshland. So um, places like most of um, Britain actually weren't really a thing, it was mostly like small little islands and mostly just the mountains of Scotland, just slightly more tropical like this. Um, so that's a fascinating fact point for you. Most of these dinosaurs in this biome didn't just live in Europe, but also live in Europe as well. We have some fascinating dinosaurs, uh, most of which we have just recently discovered. Well, okay. Science. <laughs> From Europe, we should be waltzing into what looks like Asia, and these are our progressives. These are our progressives. Um, Velociraptors. We are in um, Greek, well, we are in Mongolia. And Mongolia is very fascinating because not only is there a lot of desert in Mongolia, but there is also a lot of uh, tropical, well, sort of more temperate slash tropical uh, regions in Mongolia. Uh, lots of big forests, lots of grand lakes and all that sort of thing during the rainy season, which is what we have tried to replicate here. Slightly uh, different velociraptor biome than we may be uh, used to. But Mongolia is rather fascinating because you would think, oh, they're just deserts. But no, there's actually forests and all sorts. We also have Sungaripterus. Uh, Sungaripterus, not entirely sure what that crest was for. Again, we're assuming uh, sexual dimorphism. Um, the funky looking beaks were actually for, they used to eat shellfish, more specifically like prehistoric clams, monsters, that sort of thing. So they would use it, sort of, it's very hardened, so they'd use it to crack the shells on the green. 
There's also another species of pterosaur which we don't have on this tour called Pterodostro, which they think ate troops and is things like a penguin. Oh, they're having a little chit chat. Um, these velociraptors are based on older DNA. We haven't updated the velociraptor DNA because, I mean, they're big, scary, you know, <laughs> something for the thrill seekers. But originally, Velociraptor would not be this big. This size is more common with dinosaurs such as Utah Raptors, which we do not have on this tour. Uh, Velociraptors were actually about up to just under your knees. Uh, they were very feathery. These guys have quills, but we haven't really unlocked uh, the ability to use feathers yet. We, uh, we're still waiting on those of DNA samples from the more feathered species. But yeah. Uh, they are pack animals, they used to uh, hunt in groups, they used to hunt things such as Protoceratops, which you will see later on in this tour, um, and other things such as Ankylosaurids, obviously, um, using the sickle-shaped claw on their feet, which they are most famous for, other than the fact they are also known as Speed Thieves. Uh, that claw is actually rather vicious, but it is more uh, suited for gripping rather than slashing. So long as no none of them jump at you, you should be fine. Again, try to keep your hands and legs inside the vehicle. Some of this is of you, maybe. This is our herbivorous Asian exhibit. We have the fascinating Aurora Titan. Uh, that crest is for social displays and meeting, as well as a resonation chamber. So it makes some very interesting, um, loud, sort of high frequency cries that sort of travel for ages, much like the Parasaurolophus. They also eat water plants. We also have Archaeonophomimus, kind of sort of like a weird um, species. Their name probably will tell you more than you need to know on these. Their name translates to Ancient bird mimic. Because they kind of sort of look a little like a turkey or something. We also have Wehosaurus, a very odd um, and very sort of long. It's running away from us, it's a bit skittish today. Um, Stegosaurid species. We also have in here Pachyrannosaurus filling in for Protoceratops. Now, this is what we get a little closer to one. There we go, there's one. And there's also a Rhinosaurus marching along. This is what the Velociraptors uh, would have eaten. This is the Velociraptors' like favourite food. Uh, there is a very famous um, fossil of a Velociraptor in like the attack pose with a Protoceratops uh, buried in the sand. This is because as we all know to this day, sandstorms are very like unpredictable and infrequent in places such as deserts. So the Velociraptors are obviously hungry, attacking the Protoceratops for food, and sandstorm came along and just happened to preserve them in a very interesting and very famous specific. Moving on. How's my driving stickers there? <laughs> okay, we are in slightly tropical Australia. Like, this is the sort of outback bit that a lot of people don't um, habitate. That's even, is that even a word? This is Osraptor, a very interesting species of uh, raptorid that is named after Australia and also the Wizard of Oz. Not entirely sure why, but their emerald colouring may be something to do with it. Some dinosaurs, we uh, know the patterns so well, uh, we actually get pigment still fossilised in the uh, skeletons and we use science to unearth what that pigment is and, you know, emerald for Osraptor. 
We also have Jewish Dimbosia in here, filling in for other Australian pterosaurids, such as Kikiru and Cocosaurus. Conditions wise, we have our Australian again in the slightly tropical outback. We have the very tiny and very adorable and kind of sorry Minmi, very adorable. It's uh, sort of hopping around as well, that's very cute. We also have the beautiful but also wacky at the same time uh, Motorosaurus over there, just sort of investigating the outside world. But we got that, it's much too cold for you. Oh, at least you're having a cuddle, look at that. We also have in here, as you can see, um, we have, again, one of the mylids. Uh, these ones are, let me see if I can find it in my handy information sheet in the front of the car. They are Foldahurium, which translates to lightning clawed, because their fossils were found preserved in Hongpo in the, you know, appropriately named Lightning Ridge. Uh, this is a relatively recent discovery as well. Again, keep your eyes peeled for other such species. There's a sheep. <laughs> we have sheep as well this time. And we have our Antarctic enclosures. Beautiful. Antarctica used to be tropical, but like I said, we were trying to do the biome that it would be in today. This is sort of like a tigery, uh, Arcticish biome, such as you'd see in like Norway or Russia and places like that. Because, I mean, Antarctica doesn't have trees, but we wanted to make it seem like really fitting at the same time because you know cold but tropical also so we put some trees in just to make them feel a little more at home in this slightly cold biome. This is Cryolophosaurus. Its name translates to frozen crested lizard because it is weird pompadour like crest on the front of it and also the fact that it was found in Antarctica and Antarctica is now frozen. <laughs> they are relatively small uh, much like the Allosaurus, they prefer to hunt alone, but they also can form smaller groups of up to four to hunt larger prey, such as Antarctic Hunter, which we may see later. There is also... Ah, oh, there they are. They're hiding from us today. There is also um, small pterosaur species. Let me see my notes again to see if I can figure out what those pterosaur species are. Uh, Antarctoteryx, there we go. Or Antarctica.
hands in that crowd of souls again. Beautiful. This is good. The last Antarctic Swan Company. They are our Antarctic Pelter. Very small, very blue and white, very thematic, very cute. Very stompy today. <laughs> And top plated is what their name means. We also have a, another order for my running around. Let me check my notes. Like I said, we are underpaid. So it's a good job that they put these general information bits in the bug for us. They are... where are we? They are... Wheelosauruses. We also have, as you can see, slowly marching around, we also have a very teeny tiny um, species in here. These are Morosaurus. They are a really small Antarctic species that have been found. And that is about it, I think. I'm just double checking to see if there's other species in here, and there is not. Okay. And we are officially done with the Biomorph tour. Uh, if you would like, please uh, give us a review on more handy dandy uh, screens on your phones right now. If you have downloaded the app, please tell me you have downloaded the app. If not, please download it right now. We're a bad review, you know, tell us how we do, honestly. <laughs> but try not to mention my driving, okay? But yeah, that is visually it for the Bible Road Tour. Uh, we are now driving back rather quickly in the uh, National Park. Again, keep an eye out for other species that you might see, as well as dinosaurs. Um, there is also a um, monorail tour that goes around the outside of the National Park and around the Big Lake if you want to get a better look of the environment and of the species that you may see in the park rather than just the dinosaurs. Luckily enough, the National Park did give us a lovely planning permission to build a small park here. Thank you very much to the Department of Fish and Wildlife for that. Uh, give them a big shout out as well. Uh, this way back is rather long. <laughs> Going past the new biodomes, as you can see on the right. You can also see the lovely mountains in the back. Very scenic location, I know. There's the water, just so we know that we don't have uh, fallen further. There is a mountain goat. In this part of the tour, if you wish to take a stretch break, you can. There is no other species that will come from the climbers out of this part of the tour. There is the monorail on the right I'm talking about, just strong passes. As I said, it goes around the big lake. I think we go around the small lake as well. There's a few uh, lakes in this Canadian wilderness. I have to get this back in the room, so folks will be getting more clothes wet. Have I ever told you these things are very unyielding? Uh, we do not have uh, the modern day uh, cruise control and driving assists that uh, most modern cars do. How do you do with them? Excuse me, folks. Thank you very much. And we're back to the beginning. Thank you very much for joining us on.